Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt. My name is Bodie, and I am your host. And on today's episode, we have tons of news to get through. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Oh, you know what? Before we do that, before we jump into the news, I do need to let you know that Tuesday's show was originally supposed to be a recap of the Cybertruck. And then next week, we were going to have, we were going to cover the Cybertruck delivery event. Well, I don't think that's going to work out. I need a little bit more time to sweeten up the Cybertruck episode. And then also, it kind of makes more sense to release the you know, the, the not prequel, but the, the recap of Cybertruck, it makes more sense to re to release that on the Tuesday before the Cybertruck delivery event. I realize this is probably all sounding very confusing because <laughs> it's confusing to me. Uh, so t this Tuesday, we're going to talk about the lucid air gravity Thanksgiving, which is uh, Thursday, we'll have a special episode that I recorded with Allison Sheridan, Steve Sheridan, and um, Rob Dunwood. And then the show after that will be, or the week after that will be Cybertruck Week. Okay, hopefully that is helpful to you and not confusing to you. Our first story was brought to my attention by Allison Sheridan. If you are an Apple Maps user, good news, you can find EV charging stations right within Apple Maps. So that's really cool. And some of the connectors will actually give you availability, speed, and connector types. So that's neat. Near my house, all three of these features work. Blink and ChargePoint were the only charging station so far that I could see availability, speed, and connector type. But it's got Tesla connectors in there. It's got uh, some free connectors at a semiconductor plant. Lots of lots of cool stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go to the semiconductor plant. I don't think they're going to let me on, on site to charge my car, but it's good to know it's there. Last episode, we talked a lot about Fisker and their delivery problems. Well, Fisker exceeded 100 deliveries in a day. In one single day, 100 deliveries. Just amazing for a company that's delivered hardly any. Um, I actually saw a Fisker Ocean at a Starbucks the other day. I, I did take some pictures on the down low because it was really cool looking. And, but <laughs> there was a lady who was uh, trying to get her kids moving. And she, was kind of, she wasn't like yelling at them, but she was very irritated at them. And I decided not to ask her any questions. See, she seemed very busy, but I will say that skiing the Fisker Ocean in person, it is both bigger and smaller than I thought it would be. Uh, it's bigger than my Model Y, or felt my Model Y was parked right next to it, so it felt bigger than my Model Y. Uh, but it's a nice car. It, it, it's a really good looking car. Not for everybody, but it's definitely for me. So congratulations to Fisker. Amazon sells millions of products, but one thing they do not sell are cars, or at least not yet. Amazon will launch an online vehicle sales uh, channel, and Hyundai will be their first manufacturer to be in that channel. So you can visit Amazon, find your car, find the colors that you want, and then pick your car up at a dealership or just have it delivered to your house. So that's pretty cool. Now, that is a good deal for Amazon. It's a good deal for Hyundai, but there's a little bit more to this deal. In 2025, next generation Hyundai vehicles will get a hands-free version of Amazon's Assistant. Now, I'm not going to say what the name is, but it starts with an A. This Assistant will allow you to do everything that the A-Lady can do from your car. You can do that from your home. You can turn on lights, adjust the temperature at your house, whatever you can do. I mean, there's tons of things you can do with this. You can do all of that from the comfort of your car. Another little bonus for Amazon is that Hyundai will use Amazon AWS, which is their cloud service. That will be Hyundai's preferred cloud provider. So it's kind of a good deal for both of these companies. And, you know, we already knew that the Apple Hyundai partnership was dead, but now it's definitely, it's definitely dead. It's not being re resurrected here. Um, I would imagine 
that there was something similar or would have been similar if Amazon or if uh, Hyundai and Apple had partnered up on a uh, car. But still, um, I'm happy to see this kind of integration. There are tons of Amazon assistant users. I am not one of those people, but I could definitely see why that would be uh, beneficial if you were in that ecosystem. So that's cool. And if you're not, you don't have to use it. You can still drive a great car. And I just want to remind you, Hyundai Group is more than just, you know, Hyundai, the manufacturer. You have Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis, which is their luxury brand. And I do have a Genesis story here. The Genesis GV90 will someday be a super large three-row luxury SUV. Hyundai has broken ground on a new one5 billion dollar EV factory in Ulsan, South Korea. Hyundai has confirmed that the GV90 will be the first vehicle built at the plant. Now, again, all electric three-row SUV. It's going to be big and it's going to be luxurious. And what do I mean by luxurious? Well, normally we think BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Cadillac, you know, those are more expensive cars, but they're more accessible to the little people. Nope. Genesis has much higher expectations for the GV90. Those brands I just mentioned are for the great unwashed masses compared to Rolls-Royce and Bentley. I'll get into more of that in just a second. But the GV90 will be built on the new EM platform, which will improve driving range by 50%. And it's you know a significant advancement over the current eGMP platform, according to Hyundai. All right, let's get back into talking about competing with Rolls-Royce and Bentley. Right now, the most expensive uh, vehicle that Genesis sells, which I think is the GV80, starts around $80,000. A Rolls-Royce uh, SUV, the Cull Cullinan, Cullinan, I don't know, it's not a name that I'm going to be able to pronounce here, and or, or am I ever going to mention it again? Um that starts at $451,000. That's what it starts at. And that's at the uh, Scottsdale dealership closest to me. The Bentley at the Scottsdale de dealership closest to me, SUV costs $278,000. So the GV90, not going to be a cheap vehicle, it looks like. I mean, we'll actually see what happens when they release it. But that that's a lot of money. <laughs> So congratulations to you, Genesis. Hopefully you're able to sell a few. If you're looking for something a bit more affordable and still has three ro rows, you can lease the Kia EV9 three row SUV for $599 a month, according to Cars Direct. That lease would give you an EV9 light long range rear wheel drive electric vehicle. And if you haven't seen the Kia EV9, it looks fantastic. You get a range of 304 miles. The MSRP on this vehicle is $60,695. So it's a, it's a pricey vehicle for sure. This is a 36 month lease. You have to put $6,000 down. You get a 10,000 10, mile limit each year. And the lease price again is $599 which is not too bad for a $60,000 car, I think. I don't lease vehicles, so I'm not sure. Maybe that's not a great deal. Let me know. Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. Let's move on to Volkswagen. Volkswagen is recalling, recalling close to 24,000 ID4s, and the reason why is there's a lack of fireproofing material in the ID4's interior sunshade. Uh, VW caught this issue on an internal inspection. They've contacted their supplier to sort out the issue. I don't think it's that big of a deal. You're, if you're one of these people, you're going to get a call and they will set aside time to, to fix it. Uh, this has nothing to do with the battery on the ID4, even though some of the headlines that I read, it's not that it didn't, none of the headlines said a battery, but I felt like it was a little, I felt like the headlines implied a little bit of the battery was involved. 
I know that sounds silly and maybe it was just my biases creeping in, but it just was like, when I read the article, I was like, oh, this isn't that big of a deal. Volkswagen CEO Oliver Bloom says that an EV priced around $22,000 or 20,000 euros is possible sometime after 2025, but before 2030. The reason for the affordable price point is, in his words, advances in battery cell technology, which is a key factor in bringing down the cost. We all know that batteries, you know, the battery cell or the battery pack costs a lot of money for those vehicles. Um, VW is working on their own battery cell technology. We'll see how far that gets. But yeah, uh, I, I could definitely see a value in a $22,000 car or 20,000 euro car. Who wouldn't? It sounds amazing. The Vatican will replace their car fleet with EVs provided by Volkswagen. The Vatican has embraced green and sustainable initiatives in the past, so this is nothing new. The VW partnership will extend to Volkswagen's Skoda brand and will be made up of medium and long-term leases. The goal is to transition away from ICE vehicles by 2030. So that's cool. I wonder how many cars the Vatican buys versus the Vatican leases. Because up until this point, I just assumed that they purchased them. But maybe they just lease them. If you can replace your entire fleet in basically five years with electric vehicles, it sounds like maybe there's maybe they own very few of their cars. All right. This next story is a cautionary tale. Have you ever been so excited to update your computer that you click update without even thinking about it? And this, this by computer, I mean your car, your computer, your phone, there's an over the air update, a software update, and you're looking forward to all those new features that you're gonna get and you hit update only to have that update brick your device. I mean, that is one of the worst feelings in the world. Now imagine doing that to a $70,000 truck or SUV. How how do you think that's going to make you feel now? (laughs) Probably pretty terrible, I'm imagining. So Rivian pushed a new update recently. There was the 2023.42.0 update to R1T and R1Ss. The new features that owners would have gotten were proximity locking, vehicle access, which I'm guessing from your phone, like if you own a Tesla, you walk up and you just open up your your door if your phone's in your pocket, and gauge view. Now, some owners, when they did the update process, they experienced hung progress indicators. So it was, it got to a certain point and it didn't go any further. And others, it looked like the update had completed, but then they got blank infotainment screens. Now, Rivian says that the wrong software build with the wrong security certificates was sent out, and that's why uh, the problem occurred which does happen from time to time, or that kind of thing does happen with these over-the-air updates. Rivian canceled that update campaign, so it wouldn't impact any more customers than it needed to. Um, The good news on this is owners are still able to drive and use turn signals and lights and wipers and things like that. They just don't have access to their uh, infotainment screens. Owners are being told by Rivian, though, not to charge or restart their vehicles. So when I say restart, I mean restart and reboot the infotainment system. This is what Rivian has to say about that. The issue impacts the infotainment system. In most cases, the rest of the vehicle systems are still operational. A vehicle reset or a sleep cycle will not solve this issue. We are validating the best options to address the issue for the impacted vehicles. Our customer support team is prioritizing support to our customers related to this issue. And Rivian is hoping that they will fix this issue remotely, although they do say they may have to fix some of these vehicles uh, locally or on site. So that sucks if somebody updated their vehicle and this occurred. Fortunately, you can still drive it. I don't fully know why 
Rivian says, be cautious about charging it. I don't think it's a danger. I wonder what happens on the infotainment side. Maybe it, it makes it more complicated to roll it back. At some point, you are going to have to just charge your vehicle. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But if you own a Rivian, beware. Over the last couple of years, we've talked about Tesla's Giga Casting, their Giga Pressed. Um, but what is it actually? So according to Reuters, the Gigapress is a house-sized machine that is able to produce larger aluminum parts that are typically used in auto manufacturing. So how does this work? Well, 80 kilograms of molten aluminum is shot into a mold. A part is formed and then quickly cooled. Tesla actually uses a special aluminum alloy that they developed, which allows them to skip the traditional heat treating to make the part stronger. So that's cool. Tesla has been using the Gigapress for quite some time. What it actually ends up doing that benefits Tesla is it reduces the amount of parts needed in production. And because there are less parts, that reduces weight. It reduces robots needed to uh, uh, build the vehicle. Tesla says this reduces 600 different robots needed for assembly. And according to Tesla, it makes the cards safer. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, right now, Tesla uses the Giga casting or Giga presses on Model 3 and Model Y and soon Cybertruck. Uh, or actually currently Cybertruck, they're using a 900 or 9,000 ton gigapress for that truck. Normally these things are actually called mega presses. They're not new. Tesla didn't invent them, but the gigapress is Tesla's brand. Anyway, Toyota, GM, Hyundai, Geely, all of these companies are planning on implementing gigapresses into their manufacturing process. Now, Tesla has talked a lot about the giga presses and giga casting they believe that it is the only way to go there may be a little problem for tesla the company that tesla buys most of their giga presses presses from which is tooling and equipment international or tei gm is actually buying that company and they're hoping that TEI will help them make up some ground in the EV market. And I'm sure they'll probably, if it makes sense, use them for their ICE cars. TEI and Tesla worked closely on Gigapresses together a few years ago for the Model 3 and Model Y, which I mentioned earlier. So GM is gaining all of that knowledge from that collaboration. Now, I'm sure there's certain things that GM can't do, but that doesn't take away from the fact that employees at TEI know what's going on over there at Tesla. Um, IDRA, I-D-R-A, actually supplies the gigapresses for Cybertruck, so that's not really involved in this situation. But it'll be interesting to see if TEI continues with their current contracts with companies like Tesla, or if GM just says, nope, we we bought your company, we just want you to work on GM stuff now, and you gotta cancel all those other contracts. We'll see how that goes. Now, I do have a Tesla story in our EV segment here, and the reason why is because it is it involves giga casting, so it just made sense to throw it here. Apparently, insurance companies are concerned at uh, how expensive or how expensive it could be to repair giga casted vehicles and tesla is seeking outside help on proving that it is not more expensive to repair a model 3 or model y that uses giga casted parts according to autocar uh, sources within tesla the company is investing in research and development to find innovative repair solutions for the Megacast. Remember when I said later that this is, these are Megacast machines and Tesla just brands them as Gigacast? So that's, that's that. So find innovative repair solutions for Megacast underbody sections. They aim to develop their own repair techniques that are efficient, cost-effective, and maintain structural integrity of the vehicle. Autocar goes on to say Tesla is working with Thatcham Research to help them figure this out. Honestly, it seems like they should already had something in place by now, um, but 
you know, who am I? As someone who's trying to buy new home and auto insurance, I would like insurance companies to think that it's cheaper because it is not cheap to um, insure a Tesla. So yeah, so as long as insurance companies think it's cheaper, I'm okay with this. Let me finish out the EV section with one more GM story. GM will absorb Bright Drop, their EV commercial vehicle subsidiary. If you're not familiar with Bright Drop, think of you know exactly what Rivian's doing with the Amazon vans. That's Bright Drop. Now, the reason for this absorption is due to a lot of stuff that we don't know, but some of the stuff we do. They they said that they are reorganizing GM's electric commercial vehicle unit, and this will help them reduce cost. Unfortunately, Bright Drop CEO is out. I'm sure he will get a very nice parachute. GM remains committed to scaling Bright Drop's Zevo's production, which is good because I, I think we need more of these delivery vans, electric delivery vans. So we have the Zevo 400 and the Zevo 600. So those vehicles are still going to be made. They're just reducing what I'm guessing are a bunch of upper and middle management positions to help save money. All right. Normally I would do a Patreon plug here, but we are running out of time because the EV segment took 20 minutes just for the EV segment. We got to get to Tesla segment. So if you would like to support the show, go to the link in the show notes under support the show. You'll see how to do it there. All right, let's get to our Tesla news. A few foreign officials visited Tesla's Fremont factory recently. And honestly, I'm not even going to attempt names here because I would butcher it, butcher it really bad. I can't even speak English, much less pronounce names of dignitaries from other countries. So the Thai prime minister, Thailand's prime minister, visited the Fremont factory as well as Indi India's minister of commerce. Now, from other stories that we've talked about in the past, we both, or we both, we all know that Thailand would love a Tesla factory as would India. Moving on, Tesla has started advertising on YouTube. Apparently, the ads are focused on vehicle safety. In the ad, you have a Tesla vehicle being crash tested, and there are engineers talking over that video. So let's go ahead and listen to the audio. We're the only car maker in the world that has a, a fleet of well over a million cars on the road, fully instrumented from a, a sensing perspective. We can know exactly where the seat is. We can know where the steering wheel is. We know when the airbag deployed exactly to the millisecond. We have more data now than we've ever had before. We can understand real exposure, and then we can design our vehicles for that exposure. So Tesla mentioned or Elon mentioned at the cyber rodeo that they were going to start dabbling in advertising. So here we go. I again, I'm on YouTube a lot. I have not seen these ads. I did. I had to find it and download it so that we could play it here. But I'm surprised I haven't seen them on X because you would think as somebody who does a EV podcast that is has a specific segment just to Tesla, I have, you know, in my little circle of friends are, you know, they're all EV nerds or most of them are. It seems like if Tesla was advertising on X, I would have seen it by now. So maybe there's some regulatory thing that says that they can't. But anyway, I'm glad that they're advertising. And more than that, I'm glad to see that they're concentrating on safety features. One of the other things that I would like them to do with engineers, like I think engineers should be the stars of these commercials, is talk about, do some education on on batteries and do some education on, on drivetrains and kind of give people who aren't familiar with EVs more knowledge to make them feel more comfortable in purchasing an EV. Get rid of some of that FUD is what I'm saying. And I think having an engineer describe that is way better than having some uh, handsome or pretty face describe it. I think not that engineers can't be handsome or pretty. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that as somebody that has the knowledge to back up what they're saying, it, I think it, it, it it's stronger. I think it's uh, weighted more. 
I'm not saying, I'm not saying that engineers are ugly. Please don't come after me. I don't think that. Uh, but I'm going to leave that in because that's my own stupid fault. All right. Uh, let's move on to another Tesla story before I get myself in trouble. Is Tesla going to charge new Model 3 owners and presumably new Tesla owners for heated seats? Well, it, the answer is maybe. Hacker Green the Only did some digging into Tesla's latest software release and found some interesting tidbits in, hidden deep in the code. So what did he find? Well, he found out there may be a fee to unlock heated seats in the heated windshield wipers. And Tesla may be planning on creating like one battery pack, but software limiting that battery pack, which out of all of these things, I'm, I'm kind of okay with. Like I'm not okay with making people pay for things that are already in the car. So when Tesla builds, let's say they build a Model 3, they have heated seats for the rear, they have heated wipers, and they software locked the battery pack. And they charge, let's say, $3,000 less. Well, I'm okay a little bit with the, the software limiting on the battery pack because that makes sense. Tesla create another battery pack. It might just be as expensive or close to as expensive as it would be to just put a battery, a bigger battery pack in there and software limit it. I'm okay with that. That, that. that does not really bother me. And then, of course, Tesla will turn around and charge people a fee to unlock the rest of that battery pack if they want. For whatever reason, I'm okay with this. And part of that might be because in times of natural disasters, Tesla has shown that they are willing to open that battery pack up so that people are able to you know, flee whatever natural disaster is coming if they choose. So for what I, I don't know, I, th I think Tesla has been a good steward in, in that way. When it comes to the heated seats and the heated windshield wipers, charging extra for that just seems like too much. Um, with all of these things, you, you paid for it when you bought the car. Tesla is not taking a loss on these cars, hoping that you'll upgrade in the future. They're making money on these cars. Their margin is going to be lower, but they're still making money on these cars. So you've already paid for your heated seats. You should not have to pay for them twice. And I think that's disgusting. I didn't like it when BMW was doing it. I don't like it when Tesla's doing it. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's poor form. The battery issue becomes a little bit different to me because if Tesla had built this car with a smaller battery, then that's the range you would have got versus software limiting a battery. Like I, I understand that it's kind of the same thing. I think I'm talking about the same thing with the wipers and the, for instance, in the, in the battery pack. But if Tesla would have, would have built this battery or this vehicle and not software limited it, you were going to get a smaller battery pack anyway. Uh, Tesla is not, you know, offering to retrofit your car with heated seats. You know, you have heated seats. They're just not, they're just, they're just not letting you use them without them paying you. So I don't like this at all. Um, honestly, I think this is a bad move. Hopefully they do not choose to do this. Uh, I, I think it's, it's bad for your brand. It's like the airline companies charging you to take a bag on vacation with you. I, I think it's, I think it's poor form. And why would you put yourself through that kind of hate and, and anger anyway? All right, let's move on to a funnier story. Tesla started listing their vehicles on cars.com, their new vehicles. And car dealership guy on Twitter or on X posted, wow, this is unprecedented. Tesla has quietly started listing new vehicles on cars.com. Tesla has never sold new cars outside of its main website. I'm an investor in cars.com. And then he gives the, the link to the, you know, the vehicles with Tesla on them. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that that was going on either. And apparently Elon didn't either because he commented. <laughs> First I've heard of this seems odd. So yeah. <laughs> So Elon didn't know they were, this is the second thing we've talked about in the last few months that Elon didn't know what they were doing. Like the McDonald's in China offering the cyber spoon, which by the way, I bought one extra cyber spoon and I will be giving that away uh, for Christmas 
expect details on that. I ordered uh, three cyber spoons from China. The first one I gave to Brad, uh, my uh, daughter's boyfriend, for his birthday. The second one I'm going to keep, and the third one I'm going to give away. These things in China are very cheap. Uh, they're not as cheap uh, when you ship them to the U.S., but uh, I'm excited. So, cyber spoon. Speaking of cyber things, Tesla had an anti anti flipping clause in their Cybertruck order agreement. So basically, if a Cybertruck owner bought their truck and sold it within a year for whatever reason, Tesla could sue you for $50,000. That doesn't mean they would sue you. That means they had th th you agree that it's okay if they do sue you for $50,000. Uh, and, and in the future, going forward, Tesla may refuse to let you buy another Tesla, uh, which does just all this has bad policy written all over it. Um, Tesla's decided that it was bad policy and they have decided that they will not do it. So, uh, good, good for you, Tesla, because, uh, whoever brought this up, uh, you, you probably need to have sit down and have a conversation with them and tell them that this isn't reasonable. And I'm guessing it came from the very, 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 very top, but it could be wrong here. I, I get that you don't want some, um, you know, people who are looking to make a quick buck or, you know, several thousand bucks uh, going through and, and um, taking advantage of, of people who want to buy the Cybertruck. I, I do appreciate that part of it, but this isn't the way to do it. You could, you know, forbid them from receiving uh, uh, new te or buying new Tesla cars in, in the future. That is absolutely your prerogative. If they have other Cybertruck orders, those Cybertruck orders, instead of, you know, doing the, away with them altogether, they just get put back at the bottom of the list. There are things that you could do on this that would help curb that um, uh, scarcity of inventory problem uh, where some people are going to make money based on uh, a product that Tesla can only make 10 of in 2023, which is what they said they would deliver in the delivery event. Maybe they'll deliver 50 in 2023, but they're only going to hand over 10 cars at the delivery event. So, and speaking of delivery events, uh, all the invitations have been sent out and I did not receive a plus one invite. I'm still waiting on that. Oh, just move away from Cybertruck here and talk about union stuff. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit has ruled that Tesla can ban union shirts on on the production line. It is not a violation of labor laws. I didn't know that this was a thing, but apparently it is. And as a proud union person, um, there are certain things that I am not allowed to do at my job either that involve union stuff. So this doesn't, it doesn't really surprise me. You can't wear union t-shirts or pro union t-shirts on the production line. I will be willing to bet though, that some enterprising person at Tesla who's pro union comes up with a way to make a shirt that Tesla doesn't know is pro union, but is in reality is pro union. That's kind of what happens in these situations when you have a lot of really smart people who, um, who want to be defiant, but still follow the rules. Last week, I talked about the Tesla service workers in Sweden. Um, it looks like this is a much more complicated situation than uh, I, I realized. So, and I may have gotten some things wrong. The IF Metal is a union, but it doesn't look like they're a union that cover Tesla service workers. So, IF Metal is on strike and they want Tesla service workers to also go on strike. And IF Metal is the one having beef with Tesla Sweden. So that is, you know, worth noting. So I don't know. I read several statements from uh, Tesla Sweden workers about how IF Metal should butt out. I don't know how prevalent that sentiment is within Tesla Sweden, but there were several testimonials from uh, Tesla Sweden service workers saying, hey, uh, Tesla's pay and benefits are equivalent or better than the agreement covered by collective bargaining. 
again, I don't have any idea if that's real or not. Uh, I just mentioned I got all this stuff wrong. But IF Metal is, is willing to pay Tesla service workers 130% more than their current salaries if they join the strike because they want Tesla on board with this collective bargaining agreement. Anyway, this all sounds very complicated, and I'll keep you posted. Have you ever wondered what goes into Tesla's range calculations? Now, Tesla got in trouble a few months ago because when you, you know, jumped in your car and you ran out, you, you went out to run errands, Tesla would give you a number, a range. And for some, that range would not live up to what reality looked like when they were driving. So maybe it said they had 300 miles range. When they left the house, they drove about 30 miles, and now it says they have 220 mile range. So Tesla has given you the calculations or has given us the calculations of what goes into those, those range estimates. Uh, so they take into consideration crosswind, humidity, ambient temperature, tire pressure, wind speed and, direct, and direction, uh, elevation and grade, traffic speed, average acceleration, deceleration, ambient temperature, humidity and pressure, uh, solar load and cloud cover, initial battery percentage, initial battery temperature, gross combined vehicle weight, rolling resistance, aerodynamic drag coefficients, HVAC consumption, uh, energy uh, specific, excuse me, vehicle specific energy consumption, like bike rack or something similar like that, and whether that the battery has been preconditioned. So when Tesla, when, when, when these, when these customers were going to Tesla and there's like, I think there's something wrong with my car, I'm going to schedule a service appointment. Tesla set up a special team that would evidently run a check on that customer's car. And if there's nothing wrong with it, they called them and said, there's nothing wrong with your car. And they'd cancel the service appointment instead of, you know, actually educating their customers on what was going on with their car and why their car was normal. Uh, they did not like, I don't think it's a big deal that when you get in your car and you say, it says you have 300 miles range and you don't quite get 300 miles because I realize there are some things that the car can't account for. For instance, if you get in your car and you're like, I'm driving to California and it says you have 280 mile range, I'm in Arizona, I'm going to drive to California. Great. I have 280 miles of range. Well, it's also a hundred degrees outside in Arizona, which that happens apparently in in well into October now, which you didn't used to. Um, so that I'm going to run the HVAC a lot. I'm going to have my kids with me. I'm going to have my wife with me. That adds weight to the car. I'm going to have all of our bags with us. It also adds weight to the car. Arizona is pretty flat, so we're not going to deal with a lot of those issues. We might have some wind resistance. We might have some traffic things. The car doesn't know where you're going. So the car is like, this is your best optimized range based on, you know, what we know in the past on how you drive. They don't know I'm going to California. So I'm not going to get the 280 miles range that I thought I was going to get to start off with. I'm going to get something much less than that. I, I realized that where Tesla, and I think, um, I think this is underplayed a little bit, but where where Tesla does it right is if you put in, I'm going from my house to Disneyland, for instance. Well, Tesla is able to calculate that route. They're able to say, okay, based on that, we have this temperature, we have this grade, we have, you know, the this is what's going on with the weather. Uh, these are the traffic patterns. They're able to better calculate it. And it's actually pretty close to reality. I don't think in Tesla's inflating their estimates, I think they're giving you what in under optimum conditions you're going to get during that drive. However, you're, you're, you're not going to have optimum commission conditions with that drive. If you live in San Francisco or a place that's really hilly, you got to deal with those Hills. Like you can regenerate some of that, um, at some point, but in general, you got to deal with, with all of that, um, in terms of that's going to eat up your range a little bit. If you live in Arizona and it's 118 degrees for three weeks straight, your battery range is not going to be the same as somebody who lives in, let's say, Flagstaff, which is in the same state, but much cooler. So th those are 
my thoughts about this. The, the thing that Tesla shouldn't have done is they shouldn't have created a special team to cancel appointments. They should have created a special team to educate and reassure their customers. So I think that's that's where they they made their their wrong move there. And apparently that came directly from Elon. So, uh, you know, that just then. So if you read the Elon Musk book, which I've been avoiding talking about here, maybe I'll do an episode on it or, or I don't know. It's very interesting. Um, you know, it, it seems like, and this is a biography by Walter Isaacson, who does a really good job with biographies. It seems like Elon did not have a good childhood. Um, and you can, you can start to understand why he does certain things uh, as an adult. And yeah, I, I would just suggest that you read it for yourself to, to really get into that. But we're already long. We're at 41 minutes for this podcast. So let's go ahead and end it here. Next time you hear my voice, we're going to be talking about the gravity from Lucid Motors. I'm really excited. I've seen some specs on this car, but I haven't watched the event yet. So as of this recording, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really excited to to delve into that. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.